Hello, I'm Tim Harris. This is Julie Harris, and this is Real Estate Coaching Radio. That's right. So make sure that you hit the subscribe button so you won't miss any future episodes. Thanks again for popping by. Hit that like button, and don't forget to leave your comments and questions so we can get right back with you. We will. Thank you for continuing to make our podcast, Real Estate Coaching Radio, the number one listened to podcast for real estate professionals in at least the United States. And let us know what you think about this video. Leave your comments below. Thank you. Three, two, one, and we are back. And we've got a great topic for you today. It is a follow-up on the series we finished last week. We were discussing the top 30 lead generation ideas for all of you. Actually ended up being like 33. So this week, what we're going to do is we're taking that conversation to the next level because last week's shows were such a hit. And we're now we're going to be talking about the top 10 and you know us, it'll probably be more like top 11 or 12, mm -hmm. uh, really, I think, defined business systems. And what do we mean by that? Well, let's say, for example, you're thinking about building your business based on referral only, past clients and centers of influence. Or maybe you decide you want to be a social networking agent. Or maybe you decide you want to be marketing based. Or you guys get the idea. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to go through the top 10, I think, most common and popular business models that a lot of agents uh, will use. And then we're going to compare and contrast. And we're, really, we're going to do a straw man, steel man argument. In other words, we're going to argue for that idea and we're going to argue against it. So we're going to show you why it's a great idea and why and essentially the um, the dark underbelly of each idea so you really know what you're getting into before you start going down that path. Kind of the good, the bad, and the ugly. And we need to switch to our other notes so we yes, can we make do. sure we keep these guys on track. And this is a good time for you to start taking notes because there are several different methodologies that you're hearing about all the time. So how do you go about choosing? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it right for you? You want to look at how efficient it is. In other words, the likelihood of it to actually generate business for you predictably and duplicatably. Are you in control of it or aren't you? These are some of the filters that we're going to go through as we go into this discussion. And we're even going to talk about is the particular methodology or system free? Is it cheap? Is it costly? Is it really costly? Uh, is it skills based? How hard are the skills to obtain? Why is it good or bad in our opinion and maybe in your opinion? Is it effective or ineffective? And of course, is it passive or active? And some of these are combinations of all these. So we're going to get into the nitty gritty. Now, forgive us for being practical, but we're also going to you know, focus clearly on what's going to put you in a position to help the most people the quickest so you can make the most money the fastest, right? That's always what we're going to be focusing on. We're going to assume that none of you have the cash flow or the patience to wait years and years and years to actually see a benefit of your activity. We're going to assume that all of you are going to want to have effort equals results in a shorter time frame as possible. So as we go through these different things, we are really going to give you the nitty gritty and the pluses and the minuses of each. Now, I want you to also make it very clear where we're ultimately going to go with this is your, Julie said it a second ago, you're going to have to decide which of these ideas are best for you based on really what you bring to the table. Some of you are going to be very good at the proactive lead generation. Some of you are going to be terrible at the proactive lead generation. Some of you are really going to be good at naturally better at maybe presenting in video on social and things like that, where others of you wouldn't do it if you were held, you know, basically threatened to be sent to Mars. Do you guys get the point? That's right. And some of you listening have thousands of past clients that you can be nurturing and others of you have yet to have your first past client. So we're going to give you all of these different varieties to consider. We're going to put them through our filters so that you can really make some good decisions about what's right for you to implement. All right. So, um, and well, again, Start out, we're going to, let's just start out by having them conceptualize where we're leading. Sure. So you guys, one of the things we talk about in our coaching program and our book is Harris Rules. And our book, Harris Rules, is a lead generation wheel. You've heard us, longtime listeners, which most of you are, you've heard us talk about this concept many, many times. And the reason we came up with this concept is because I think ultimately it helps to clarify what really matters and what order you should be adding spokes. So we're not going to tell you right now what order that we would suggest you add spokes. We're going to let you choose yourself. But you have to at least uh, visualize uh, what I'm about to describe to you. So I want you to visualize an old fashioned bicycle wheel or an old fashioned wagon wheel, something with multiple spokes on it. And there's this big circle and in the side, inside of the big circle, there's a small circle and that's the hub of the wheel. And then each, uh, then there's multiple spokes. You guys get the concept? Now let's pretend it's a bicycle wheel. If you're rolling down the street and the bicycle wheel only has one or two spokes and you hit a pebble on the road, obviously the, the wheel doesn't have enough structural integrity and the wheel is going to fail. Make sense? So what you need to build is fast 
fast as you can is you need to build at least five to seven really solid spokes on that wheel. So no matter what the market or the world throws at you, that wheel is going to be able to you know withstand any sort of headwinds or any sort of deviations and um, you know frankly in the road. You guys get the concept. Uh, you're going to have to decide based on what we tell you which are going to be the most effective and least effective. What, if we were coaching you, what we would tell you to do is do uh, the most effective first, but you're going to have to decide whether the most effective is something that you will be able to get uh, efficient at quick enough to make it so that you last in real estate. Hopefully this this makes sense. Well, that's right. So the answer is never going to be there's just one thing to hang your hat on. It's going to be the combination, just like you need multiple spokes in your wheel. It's also not going to be something where you're going to try out this and then try out that. The idea of dabbling and having results come to you, you need to erase from your mind because none of these are particularly set it and forget it. That's right. And that's a really important point. But again, once you have your core spokes on your wheel, uh, again, Julie said it correctly. you got to make sure you're going back there and reinforcing those spokes. It's not just one and done. You have to actually work it. You have to work it. All right. So we're going to go in a uh, – work. let me – Julie, let's do these in a different order, okay? Sure. You decide. Let's do geographic farming because that's something that all of them will relate to. So let's do something that people yes. can – right. We'll, we'll give them the, the – uh, We'll talk about what it is and the good and the bad and the ugly. So those of you taking notes, geographic farming is our first category, sometimes called geofarming. And that can include things like postcards, analytics-based companies like SmartZip or EveryDoor Direct. But really what we're talking about is concentrating on a geographic farm, a neighborhood, if it's really big, or a set of neighborhoods, perhaps a zip code, an MLS code. Right. So what the, it's a model that's been around since the beginning of time. And you essentially choose a geographic area. And then the concept of the geographic farming uh, concept is that you will mail in postcards, do all kinds of different things into that particular geographic farm over a long period of time. And your goal is essentially to have this kind of falls into the same guise of marketing and branding. But again, a lot of agents will get into the business and say, I'm going to geo farm a particular area and that's mm-hmm. going to be my source of lead generation. Um, so the pluses and the minuses of this idea. It's passive. There's not a lot of skill required. No. And you, uh, You're probably not going to get a lot of obvious rejection other than maybe not getting the calls. It could be perceived that way. Right. So if you want to do geo farming, if you want to do direct mail or even digital geo farming or anything like that, and I know there's ways to do it through Google and things like that. If you wanted to do that, uh, it is something that will require zero skill, very, very low skill, because for the most part, there are companies that you can pay to do this for you. Uh, including the direct mail. And it's, again, something that is going to be zero rejection, zero skill. Now, this, where are you, where the rubber meets the road, though, frankly, is if you get a, say, for example, seller that's thinking about selling and they happen to receive your postcard on that day and you don't actually know how to get the listing, then all that geo farming and postcard mailing and everything else you've done has just gone to naught. So, so you're still going to need a level of skill when the, those leads come in. Now, I don't know about your research, but my latest research is it's always pretty consistent on this stuff that especially when it's a direct mail piece, it's about a one to three percent return. So maybe one out of 100 people might call you if you hit them on the right day where they're thinking of moving or have to move. Uh, So you have to keep that in mind. And that's why if you're going to do the geo farming, you have to be committed to doing it for a long period of time, very consistently. It will not work if you do it now and then, maybe when you feel like you're leadless or you're going to try something out. This only really works with a lot of consistent effort and expenditure. And by a long period of time, it could mean years. And how many of you right now are stuck in some sort of maybe even contract with one of these companies like that does it for you, you know, passively where you just give them a credit card number and they mail out the cards for you every month. And every time uh, you are paying that bill, you're asking them, where the hell are my results? And they're saying, well, you have to do it for longer. You have to do it for longer. You have to do it for longer. So why maybe more pieces too. So why doesn't the geo farming type stuff work? Well, guess what? You're not the only one geo farming that particular area. Or, you know, they're also going to tell you, well, you need to do a broader area. Or they're going to say, well, it turns out that there's not enough people moving that particular area, so on and so on. So the good part of geo farming, totally passive. Mm-hmm. You have you can have low skill and occasionally you're going to, you know, win the lottery basically and have a seller call you. And no rejection. And no rejection. Hopefully you will have the skill to get the listing. Uh, the downside, very speculative, very expensive, especially if you do it over a long period of time with no results. 
Um, and frankly, it's not predictable or duplicatable. You cannot wake up every single day and know for sure you're going to get a lead from geo farming. And, uh, you know, we've had a lot of coaching clients. I'll give you the pluses and the minuses mm-hmm. from actual practical coaching client, uh, client experience. Michael and Robin Gordon, who are some of the top agents in the nation in terms of dollar volume and units. I think they're worth uh, Berkshire, if I remember correctly. So they're one of our first coaching clients. And they started out by geo farming this area called the main line in uh, Philadelphia. And it's a very expensive area. And here's the best part. Nobody else was doing uh, really good, consistent postcard mailings, what they did. And so they were able, Michael and Robin were able to, over maybe about 18 months, they were actually able to pretty much start getting uh, every listing. They were getting tons of listing leads from their postcards. And it was something that was working really, really well. Now the postcards were beautiful and they were ridiculously expensive and they were ridiculously expensive to mail out every month, but they didn't care because their average commission was so high. Well, a lot of people don't know what the main line is. It's a very expensive area. So their average commission is going to maybe reinforce some of that expenditure and that made it okay. Now, what happened is over time and about 18 months, like I said, Every main, every a mainline competitor started copying them. In some cases, copying their postcards almost exactly, and that then started to basically, obviously, dilute the effectiveness of their postcards. Because what happens, and Julie said this, is the postcard concept. You guys are sold on the idea that doing geo farming, you're somehow going to carve out some sort of sacred spot in their brains where you're going to become the Kleenex of real estate. Now, maybe I didn't say that right. Let me rephrase it. Right. So when people think tissue, they think Kleenex. Right. You guys get the concept. And so a lot of these marketing companies will tell you your job is to make it. So when people think real estate in your geographic area, they think of, you know, Tim and Julie Harris. Right. And I know a lot of you are laughing at yourselves because you've heard these messages before. You've heard these sales pitches before. But the concept is uh, uh, it's founded in actual provable marketing and provable, provable results. But now why doesn't it work? For reasons I just stated, it's oversaturated. Too many people are doing it, but also social media and a lot of other things like that have sort of nullified the results because a lot of people, when they get that postcard, unless they're thinking about actually doing a transaction that particular day, they don't even look at it. It just goes right to the trash can. Right. That's right. And, you know, there's trash cans right beside the mailboxes when they're picking that up and it just goes in there unless you hit the jackpot on the exact day. And also, you're, t- you're at the risk of them not already knowing an agent. So there's, the thing about this is that there are so many factors that can get in between you and the prospect. Another agent who started farming the same area, it could be that you just simply picked the wrong neighborhood where the amount of moves are not really happening that much. Now, let me give you another example where it worked. So we're giving you the pluses and the minuses. We're mm-hmm. giving, you know, straw manning and steel manning, every one of these, right? Uh, we had a recent coaching client, another higher end agent out in LA. And what they were doing was handwritten notes that when this was a compass agent, they were doing handwritten notes to specific homeowners in a particular, in a geographic area, but the average sale price was super high. I think it was over 7 million if I remember correctly. And they actually did get two or three listings from it. And so there's, I think two or three companies now that will, um, very, very, very expensive that will do a handwritten note using a high end stationery, using an actual Mont Blanc pen that looks like somebody actually hand wrote it. And then the envelope is handwritten. The stamp is hand affixed. You guys get the point. It looks like something if somebody's mailing to you to invite you to some sort of event. Um, and those actually really did work for these guys. But guess what happened? It became saturated. Their competitors quickly figured out what they were doing and started copying what they were doing. How did the competitors know they were doing it? Because some of the competitors lived in the very houses they were all ma- mailing their letters to. Exactly. <laughs> and, you, and you can't scrub your list to the point where none of your competition is ever going to see what you're doing anyway. So that, you know, I think what I was going to ask you is, do you think that that was working for a while simply because it was different before it got copied by everyone? For sure. Yeah. But I like the idea. So if you're, so Julie's asking that question because she's using her coach's brain. If you're in a market where there isn't something like this going on and it is oversaturated with a lot of people doing direct mail and you have a sale price that's high enough that you can essentially afford the, to invest in this over the long term, then maybe you want to consider doing this. But you got to realize a lot of this is going to take an extraordinary amount of time, years before you get any result. And you got to do your homework ahead of time. You got to know the area that you're mailing in. You got to know how fast the homes turn over. You got to know who else is doing direct mail in those areas. You got to do a lot of research. And by the way, 
way, that's one of the things that our coaches will help you with when you join Premier Coaching. When you're deciding which spokes to add to your wheel first, again, it's based on your particular uh, real estate market, but also your particular natural skill set and your tolerance, what you're willing to actually do. I mean, these things are all important. We can't just shove you into a a business model and say, okay, you're now just going to call FISBOs and expired. You're only going to do, you know, cold calling or you're only going to do actual over the phone work. 99% of you will never do it or you won't do it because you'd much rather do something that will get you a result with less skill. We get it. We totally understand. But again, you decide based on your natural aptitudes and tolerance for pain, let's be honest, and your financial fortitude, you decide which of these are going to be best for you. Um, But again, geofarming is a great thing to start. So one of the things our coaches will help you understand. And all you've got to do if you want to join Premier Coaching is just text the word Premier to 47372. Text the word Premier to 47372. And you can join Premier Coaching 100% for free. Or you can just go to PremierCoaching.com, PremierCoaching.com. And remember, uh, you do uh, receive a daily semi-private coaching call with one of our Harris Certified Coaches every single weekday when you join Premier Coaching for free right now. So just text the word Premier to 47372 or just go to PremierCoaching.com. Remember when texting, message and data rates may apply. All right, Julie, let's move on to the next one. Okay, so the next one, which may make sense for some of you, many of you, is probate. Now, probate is the process that happens when somebody passes away and their the home, their asset, has now got to be sold and the proceeds are going to go to their heirs. It is a legal process. There are attorneys who specialize in probate. There's a company we like called alltheleads.com that will help you find probate uh, information, phone numbers, probate leads. And, of course, as part of Premier Coaching, you also get the follow-up letters, the scripts. It is a system. It's not just getting the lead. You actually have to follow the system. Bruce Hill, who was one of our hair certified coaches, who now is coaching, actually, for all the leads, has produced a bunch of videos that are waiting for you on Premier Coaching that teach you how to pursue to pursue pr- probate. Some of you, and I'll be super direct with you to save you the learning curve, are perfect for probate, honestly. Well, explain what you mean by that. <laughs> Julie's having me walk into the line. Do you lines. mean because – well, I'll give you, you – know, yeah. we can have a discussion about it. In my opinion, and I agree with you. Uh, If you are more business oriented, if you are a little bit maybe more transactional, more process oriented, and I would add a little level of patience to this because it can be a little bit longer process. More analytical. More analytical, a little bit maybe more dry personality. This is perfect for you. Now, the good thing about probate is that it is clearly a home that must sell. There's motivation behind it. There is intention behind it. We're not rolling the dice and 100% of your probate contacts are to somebody who has a house to sell or to an attorney that is handling that. So we're making a mistake of assuming that they know what probate is. So probate happens when somebody passes away, but lists or homes can also, so someone passes away in a lot of States, unless a home passes uh, through a trust, it depends on the state laws, right? Right. Um, We teach you all this, all the nuance of each state in your, and premier coaching. But so somebody passes away that house is has to pass through probate unless it's in a trust. In some cases, the, a probate uh, attorney will also handle uh, the assignment of listings when it comes to divorces and things of that nature. De- again, depends on their particular state. Mm-hmm. But the reality of it is, is this is, as Julie just said, it's a low emotion mm-hmm. um, type of business transaction because you are – in the most truest sense, you're solving a problem. So somebody passes away, the house has to be sold. The ask, the you know money from the uh, sale of the house then has to be passed to the heirs. The uh, judge will then assign a an executor, th- an executor who is generally speaking, a, well, the executor would be someone represented by the family yes. or in a probate attorney, right? Depending on your state, again, but right. Yes, but the bottom line is there is a house to sell. That's right. And you're going to be working directly with probate attorneys. And in Premier Coaching, we teach you what to say. We help you get the phone numbers. We help you uh, literally get lists of uh, the houses that are in probate in your particular market. We then tell you who to call. We tell you what to say. That's all included. It's very systematic. It is. Now, some of you, that's going to be perfect. There's no dancing around on a TikTok video if you're doing probate. Absolutely not. (laughs) And I don't think you should be if you're doing probate. But uh, also, there tends to be less competition from other agents because not i mean how many of you listening right now this is the first time you've ever heard of this as a lead source you don't have the same level of competition as you would from some of the other spokes now the pluses and minuses we just told you the pluses we like probate Mm -hmm. in some markets probate is a cash cow here's the downside in some markets it's oversaturated again you're going to have the you know essentially the probate attorneys 
already have their preferred agents that they're working with. Now, we do in Premier Coaching tell you how to you know, romance the probate attorneys if you're dealing directly with an attorney to get the listings. And in some cases, you're going to contact a probate attorney on the very day that he has you know, 10 listings or 10 houses that need to be sold. And maybe his existing uh, real estate contact can only sell or take three of them or whatever. He's looking for somebody new. You can probably win that business. And there's no referral fees with probate too. Which is great. Unless, of course, the attorney happens to have a real estate license. And in some states, when you have a, a law license, you actually are all you able, have to, to practice, yeah. able to practice real estate as well. But you'll work through this. So again, the pluses are it's a very – it's. I would say in some markets, it is actually predictable and duplicatable. Yes, it is. And you'll, people, you'll find pe- your ratio. Because yeah. people are always going to, you know, die. This is a fact of life now, isn't it? <laughs> That's predictable and duplicatable. It is. Well, so let's talk about how you might scale that. Once you figure out the pretty simple system, scripts, postcards, it's got a lot of follow-up and that sort of thing. Once you figure that out, well, there's no nothing saying that you have to deal with just one probate attorney. There are multiple probate attorneys in multiple different areas of your town. So you can certainly scale it that way. And it, if you wanted to talk, since we're talking about attorneys, I kind of put divorce attorneys sort of in this category sure. as well. It's a similar process with similar attributes, such as there will be a house that's going to sell when there's a divorce decree and the legal you know, uh, filing has happened. The divorce attorney is going to say, here is how the proceeds are going to split up and that this house has to be on the market by a certain date and it's time to, sh- to choose a realtor. So and many times because it is a divorce situation, the couple will say, you know what, divorce attorney, you choose because we don't want to fight about this or, the or they ju- already have a relationship. Or the judge will basically uh, get in, in the, you know, the divorcing couple can't decide who the listing agent is going to be. When you're in real estate long enough, you will trip over situations like that. I can just, For sure. my, my mind is filling through the ones that we had to deal with like <laughs> yes. that. And so what will sometimes happen is the judge will say, okay, enough is enough. And then he's basically going to use, again, like we referred, he's going to use this process to essentially assign a realtor. Now, the reason we do like this is once you have the relationship, you don't have to actually go out and compete for this listing every time. Whereas if you're going after right. one house, you know, one listing after another, after another, after another, those are all individual seller relationships you have to have. With this, you maybe have five, six maybe only three probate attorney relationships. And then once you've got their business, generally speaking, they're not going to ask you to show them their, your listing presentation with every single listing They'll they trust send you. you. Right. right. So, and we are big fans of one contact, multiple opportunity, one probate attorney, multiple potential listings for you. Then you have a second attorney. Then you add divorce attorney. So you can see how this actually is scalable. The other thing I really like about this, Tim, is that there's no referral fee. Again, unless they happen to have a real estate license or in a state where practicing law allows you to sell real estate. But if they are a divorce divorce attorney or a probate attorney, probably that's more their thing than selling real estate. And they probably still will refer to you. And even so, if there is a little referral fee, it's still going to be less than some of the other things. You got it. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to wrap up on today's show and then we're going to pick up uh, tomorrow where we left off today. So what we're doing, just a reminder, and if you're just new to listening to our podcast, you have found the nation's number one listen to daily and downloaded daily real estate podcast. So congratulations on doing that. Listen every single day because what we really do is drill down and held it. Uh, frankly, put you guys in a position where you can help more people and make more money because of this market. So the lead generation spokes, hopefully that is solidifying in your mind. Hopefully you're starting to understand it. So today we talked about geographic farming. Uh, we talked about probate. Tomorrow we're going to talk about uh, notice of uh, notice of default and distressed real estate. We're going to talk about open houses. We're going to talk about new construction. All of these things are potential spokes, and we're going to give you the pluses and the minuses of each. Now, again, let's go so far. What we've noticed, geographic farming, very expensive. It takes a long damn time. Passive. Passive. Probate, not very expensive, frankly, but it is more proactive. You're going to have to know what to say and how to say it. It's going to take more skill. And again, some of you really don't have the personalities to want to be uh, working on that as a business because you're going to be too jovial. You're going to be too demonstrative. You're going to be too, you know, frankly, salesy. And a lot of the attorneys aren't going to like that. So you're going to have to decide what's the Mm -hmm. best fit for you. So we're going to pick up tomorrow where we left off today. Thank you for keeping this number one listen to daily podcast for real estate professionals in at least the United States. And we'll talk with you on the show tomorrow. Hello, thank you for having watched this video. Please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel. 
That's right, and don't forget to hit that like button, leave your comments and questions below, and we will get right back with you. Thank you for watching this video. Remember to watch the next one. You're going to love that one. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.